So our next speaker is Larry Morris. Larry Morris is an independent writer and historian and is the author of a documentary history of the Book of Mormon. He was previously an editor with both the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship and the Joseph Smith Papers. He's co-editor on a number of books and I'm sure you'll enjoy his presentation. So here is Larry Morris. Thank you very much. I'm uh, honored to be here and really glad to speak about one of my favorite subjects, the eight witnesses. Let's start by reviewing their testimony. This was the version that was published in the 1830 Book of Mormon. Be it known unto all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people, unto whom this work shall come, that Joseph Smith, Jr., the author and proprietor of this work, has shown unto us the plates of which hath been spoken, which have the appearance of gold, and as many of the plates as the said Smith has translated, we did handle with our hands, and we also saw the engravings thereon, all of which has the appearance of ancient work and of curious workmanship. And this we bear record with words of soberness that the said Smith has shown unto us, for we have seen and hefted, and know of a surety that the said Smith has got the plates of which we have spoken. And we give our names unto the world to witness unto the world that which we have seen, and we lie not, God bearing witness of it. The Joseph Smith Papers has a good uh, summary of the uh, eight witnesses' testimony. Unlike the testimony signed by the three witnesses, which borrowed most of its language from the Book of Mormon, this statement reads like a legal document and describes a sensory experience that involved both sight and touch as the witnesses handled and lifted the plates. The differences between the uh, three witness testimony and the eight witness testimony are striking. The three is a very religious document. It mentions the grace of God at least twice, um, and they tell of hearing God's voice, uh, declaring the authenticity of the translation. They saw an angel who came down with the plates and heard the voice of the Lord uh, commanding them to bear record. Joseph Smith is not mentioned a single time in the testimony of the three. The eight is uh, strictly empirical. They speak of, uh, and they mention Joseph Smith four different times as the one who showed them the plates that they, they saw and hefted. And while the uh, testimony of the three is a testimony of the Book of Mormon and of the Savior, the testimony of the eight testifies of one thing, Joseph Smith has the plates. Uh, one criticism that we see, this is a typical example uh, from Dan Vogel. As a historical document, the testimony of the eight is disappointing. It fails to give historical details such as time, place, and date. Neither does it describe the historical event or events, but simply states that the eight signatories collectively have seen and handled the plates. I think that point is well taken, and it's unfortunate that we don't have some of the background. Uh, David Whitmer, for example, uh, when he told of the ex uh, experience that he and Oliver had with Joseph, he gives a fair amount of uh, historical background telling what happened right before and where they went when they had this experience and mentions how they were sitting on a log uh, when the angel appeared. So it is unfortunate that we don't have the kind of historical background for the testimony of the eight. Nevertheless, I believe the uh, Eight witness testimony is just a uh, unique and valuable document. It is emphatically empirical, mentioning the senses of both sight and touch, identifying Joseph Smith as the one who displayed the, 
plates and making no mention of a supernatural setting. It thus qualifies as a historical account and is therefore fully in, able to be investigated through uh, historical methodology. And moreover, it meets three crucial standards of source criticism by being one, a first-hand document, two, produced near the time of the event in question, and three, signed by multiple witnesses. That is really good. The, one of the amazing things about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon is that uh, Joseph Smith first reported uh, Moroni's visit in 1823, and he received the plates in September of 1827, but for that time period, four years, so crucial, well, we do not have a single contemporaneous document mentioning the Book of Mormon. We have quite a few people who, who later gave reminiscences, such as Joseph and Lucy and the uh, Harmony neighbors, for example. Many people gave reminiscences, but no document that was created during that time period. So we rely quite a bit on reminiscences to kind of reconstruct uh, what happened with the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. But the testimony of the eight was created close to the time that they uh, had their experience. And you've got eight witnesses, which is a really good number, strong, a first person. I think it is the most valuable document uh, related to the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. We have different accounts of the eight uh, testifying as a group. Uh, the day that uh, the eight had their experience, it took place in Manchester, New York. As you may remember, the uh, experience of the three witnesses happened in Fayette, near the Whitmer farm. And Lucy Mack Smith wrote that uh, they then, the, the party kind of moved over to Manchester, and that was where the eight had their experience. And she said, after these eight witnesses returned to the house, we held a meeting in which all the witnesses bear, bore testimony to the facts, as stated above. And she has just included the testimonies of the three and the eight in her history. Luke Johnson attended a conference in October of 1831 and said, at this conference, the 11 witnesses to the Book of Mormon with uplifted hands, isn't that interesting, bore their solemn testimony to the truth of that book. So in that case, from what he said, the eight were not necessarily speaking of their experience of uh, handling and seeing the plates, but bearing testimony to the truth of the Book of Mormon. Uh, John Corll joined the church in 1831. He got to know all the witnesses quite well. And in his history, which was commissioned by Joseph Smith and was published after he was excommunicated, he had lost his faith in Joseph. He wrote, Eleven persons besides Smith bore, tes bore positive testimony of the Book of Mormon. I was unable to impeach their testimony and thought that it was as consistent to give credit to them as to credit the New Testament. Let's take a look at the uh, different witnesses in the order of their deaths. For a Christian and Peter Whitmer, Jr., we do not have uh, first-hand accounts of theirs other than the uh, testimony of the eight itself. They were uh, both living in Missouri uh, when they died in 1835 and 1836, respectively. After their death, Oliver Cowdery wrote the following. Among those who have gone home to rest are Christian and Peter Whitmer, Jr., both included in the list of eight witnesses of the Book of Mormon. 
And though they have departed, it is with great satisfaction that we, we reflect that they proclaim to their last moments the certainty of the former testimony. Then Lyman White was in Ohio in 1830 when Parley P. Pratt, Oliver Cowdery, uh, Peter Whitmer Jr., and Ziba Peterson arrived on their mission. And of, that, of meeting those four missionaries, Lyman White wrote in 1882, there came along in Ohio, there came along four men, namely P. Pratt, O. Cowdery, P. Whitmer, and Ziba Peterson. We called a meeting, and one testified that he had seen angels, probably Oliver, another that he had seen the plates, probably Peter, and the gifts were back in the church again. Of that uh, mission, they went, they went on to uh, Independence, Missouri, of course, and Christian, well, Peter, uh, Peter Jr. offered this brief de uh, description of their mission. 1830, the word of the Lord came unto me by the prophet Joseph Smith on the tenth month, saying, Peter, thou shalt go with thy brother Oliver to the Lamanites. We started on the same month to the west to the tribe of Buffalo, and there we declared the Book of Mormon from thence to the state of Ohio. There we declared the fullness of the gospel and had much success. Uh, Joseph Smith, Sr., we don't have a first-hand account from him describing the, his experience as one of the eight witnesses. But we do have some interesting accounts from others. When Joseph brought the plates uh, back to the Smith home in Manchester in uh, September of 1827, William was one of those who uh, witnessed this event. And he wrote, the time to receive the plates came at last. When Joseph received them, he came in and said, Father, I have got the plates. All believed it was true. Father, mother, brothers, and sisters. And several members of the Smith family, if not all of them, handled the plates at this time. William continues, when the plates were brought in, they were wrapped in a tow frock. My father put them in a pillowcase. So this would mean an instance of uh, Joseph Sr. handling the plates separate from his experience as one of the eight. Then um, Joseph Sr. had a very interesting experience when he was imprisoned for a debt. Early in the autumn of 1830, a Quaker called at the Smith home and demanded payment from Joseph Sr. for a note of $14, which he had bought from Joseph Sr.'s creditor. Joseph Sr. offered him all that he had, which was $6, with a promise for the remainder, and Lucy was willing to give him her gold beads. But the man said that unless Joseph paid the whole debt at once, he would go to jail. The Quaker even offered to forgive the debt if the Smiths would burn up their copies of the Book of Mormon. This Joseph Sr. refused, and he was taken into custody by a constable. He was held in Canandaigua, about seven miles south-southwest of Manchester. And uh, Joseph Sr.'s recital featured here was related to Lucy by way of Samuel. So it's, Lucy's account is uh, third-hand. But this is what uh, Joseph Sr. reportedly said. Immediately after I left your mother, the men by whom I was taken commenced using every possible argument to induce me to renounce the Book of Mormon, saying how much better it would be for you to deny that silly thing than to be disgraced and imprisoned when you might not only escape this, but also have the note back, as well as the money which you have paid on it. To this I made no reply. They still went on in the same manner till we arrived at the jail when they hurried me into this dismal dungeon. I shuddered when I first heard those heavy doors creaking upon their hinges, but then I thought to myself, I was not the first man 
who had been imprisoned for the truth's sake. And when I should meet Paul in the paradise of God, I could tell him that I too had been in bonds for the gospel which he had preached. And this has been my only consolation. Hiram Smith left a powerful first-hand account. This was in a letter to the saints written in December of 1839, after uh, he and uh, Joseph had endured so much uh, persecution in Missouri. I thank God that I felt a determination to die rather than deny the things which my eyes had seen, which my hands had handled, and which I had borne testimony to wherever my lot had been cast. And I can assure my beloved brethren that I was enabled to bear as strong a testimony when nothing but death presented itself as I ever did in my life. William, William McClellan uh, turns out to be a great compiler of uh, testimonies from the, uh, both the eight and the three witnesses. And he was preaching with Hiram in September of 1831, and he wrote, Brother Hiram then arose and bore testimony to the truths which they had heard and gave them his evidence of the truth of the Book of Mormon. In 1838, uh, Sally Parker heard Hiram speak as he was on his way moving from uh, Kirtland to uh, Missouri. We were talking about the Book of Mormon. He said he had but two hands and two eyes. He said he had seen the plates with his eyes and handled them with his hands. More from Hiram. Uh, Joseph Fielding, of course, was his brother-in-law, and he wrote, My sister Mary bears testimony that her husband has seen and handled the plates, etc. In short, I see no reason that anyone can have for rejecting this work. Then a newspaper article from 1843 in Massachusetts. We have seen Hiram Smith, the brother of Joseph, and heard him preach and conversed with him about his religion, its origin, and progress. And we heard him declare in this city in public that which is recorded about the plates, etc., is God's solemn truth. Samuel Smith died about a month after uh, Joseph and Hiram. And unfortunately, we don't have a first-person account written by Samuel. But you may remember that after the Book of Mormon was published, right after, uh, Samuel took copies and went out uh, doing missionary work. And of course, he met the Young family and Phineas Young, Brigham's brother, who would later be a brother-in-law to Oliver Cowdery, remembered that experience. Ah, said I, you, referring to Samuel, are one of the witnesses. Yes, said he, I know the book to be a revelation from God translated by the gift and power of the Holy Ghost, and that my brother Joseph Smith is a prophet, seer, and revelator. Then William McClellan again, 1831, in his journal. I spoke about the evidences of the Book of Mormon, and Brother Samuel arose and bore testimony of what had been said and of the Book of Mormon. Daniel Tyler, in 1883, wrote of an experience he had in 1832. Elder Smith delineated the circumstances of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, of which he was a witness. He knew his brother Joseph had the plates, for the prophet had shown them to him, and he had handled them and seen the engravings thereon. Hiram Page married Catherine Whitmer in 1825, and he's a, he's a great witness. And in a letter to William McClellan, uh, 
uh, this is what he wrote. In the next place, you want to know my faith relative to the Book of Mormon and the winding up of wickedness. As to the Book of Mormon, it would be doing injustice to myself and to the work of God of the last days to say that I could know a thing to be true in 1830 and know the same thing to be false in 1847. To say my mind was so treacherous that I had forgotten what I saw. To say that a man of Joseph's ability, who at that time did not know how to pronounce the word Nephi, could write a book of 600 pages as correct as the Book of Mormon without supernatural power. And to say that those holy angels who came and showed themselves to me as I was walking through the field to confirm me in the work of the Lord of the last days, three of whom came to me afterwards and sang an hymn in their own pure language. Yea, it would be treating the God of heaven with contempt to deny these testimonies with too many others to mention. William McClellan again. When the mob was raging in Jackson County in 1833, some young men ran down Hiram Page and commenced beating him with whips and clubs. One of them said, if you deny that book, we will let you go. Said he, how can I deny what I know to be true? They pounded him again. A couple of later uh, references to, to Hiram Page. Uh, John C. Whitmer, the son of Jacob Whitmer, wrote, I was closely connected with Hiram Page in business transactions and other matters, he being married to my aunt. I knew him at all times and under all circumstances to be true to his testimony concerning the divinity of the Book of Mormon. And Hiram Page's son, Philander Page, I knew my father to be true and faithful to his testimony of the divinity of the Book of Mormon until the very last. Whenever he had an opportunity to bear his testimony to this effect, he would always do so and seemed to rejoice exceedingly in having been privileged to see the plates and thus become one of the eight witnesses. As I mentioned, uh, two of the Whitmers died in good standing in Missouri. But in 1838, uh, John Whitmer and Peter Whitmer were both, John Whitmer and David Whitmer, I should say, were both excommunicated. And Hiram Page and J Jacob Whitmer both left the church. But you can tell throughout the remaining 30 or 40 years, the Whitmers continued to bear a very strong testimony of the Book of Mormon. Jacob Whitmer is a good example of that. Left the church in 1838, died in 1856. And his son, John C. Whitmer, said, My father, Jacob Whitmer, was always faithful and true to his testimony of the Book of Mormon and confirmed it on his deathbed. Flander Page again. I can also testify that Jacob, John, and David Whitmer, and Oliver Cowdery, they were all uncles of his, died in full faith in the divinity of the Book of Mormon. I was with all these witnesses on their deathbeds and heard all bear their last testimony. John Whitmer lived longer than any of the other eight witnesses, and of the three, uh, David lived the longest. As I mentioned, uh, John was excommunicated in March of 1838. And he left some really good first-person accounts. In the history that he wrote, uh, which was commissioned by Joseph Smith, he said, and also other witnesses, even eight, are the men to whom Joseph Smith Jr. showed the plates, reiterating, reiterating what they said in their testimony. These witnesses' names go forth also of the truth of this work in the last days. In March in 1836, uh, in an editorial 
in The Messenger and Advocate. He wrote, I have most assuredly seen the plates from whence the Book of Mormon is translated, and I have handled those plates and know of a surety that Joseph Smith, Jr. has translated the Book of Mormon by the gift and power of God. At the end of his life, John Whitmer was still bearing testimony. In a letter to Heman C. Smith, he said, I conclude you have read the Book of Mormon and read my name as one of the eight witnesses to said book. That testimony was, is, and will be true henceforth and forever. E.C. Brand, I visited Mr. John Whitmer at his residence on the 18th of February, 1875. It was two years before uh, John's death. He also bore his testimony to me concerning the truth and declared that his testimony as found in the testimony of eight witnesses in the Book of Mormon is strictly true. John C. Whitmer, of my Uncle John, I was with him a short time before he died when he confirmed to me what he had done so many times previously, that he knew the Book of Mormon was true. Given all of these testimonies, it's a little difficult to see how people can argue that the experience of the eight was not empirical. Well, let's discuss some of those claims that they saw the plates in vision. And frequently when someone claims that the eight saw the plates in vision, the next step is to conclude that they must have seen the plates simply in their imagination. Thomas Ford, if you remember, he was the governor of Illinois who failed to protect uh, Joseph and Hiram before they were uh, murdered in Carthage jail. And uh, in the 1840s, he wrote a history of Illinois and, of course, wanted to give a history of the saints. And the, uh, this history was uh, published after he died. He says, the most probable account of the witness statements is that they were part of a conspiracy. Then, maybe just to cover his bases, he says, I have been informed by men who were once in the confidence of the prophet, he doesn't say who they, who they were, that the prophet privately gave a different account of the matter. The prophet had always given out that the plates could not be seen by the carnal eye but must be spiritually discerned that the power to see them depended upon faith and was the gift of God to be obtained by fasting, prayer, mortification of the flesh, and exercises of the spirit. Therefore, when Joseph saw, quote, the evidences of a strong and lively faith in any of his followers, he set them to continual prayer and other spiritual exercises to acquire this lively faith by means of which the hidden things of God could be spiritually discerned. Then, when he could delay them no longer, he assembled, he assembled them in a room and produced a box, which he said contained the precious treasure. The lid was opened, the witnesses peeped into it, but making no discovery, for the box was empty, they said, Brother Joseph, we do not see the plates. Joseph responded, O ye of little faith, how long will God bear with this wicked and perverse generation? Down on your knees, brethren, every one of you, and pray God for the forgiveness of your sins and for a holy and living faith which cometh down from heaven. Lumping the three and eight witnesses together, Ford claimed that they dropped to their knees and began to pray in the fervency of their spirit, supplicating God for more than two hours with fanatical earnestness at the end of which time, looking again into the box, they were now persuaded that they saw the plates. It's a rumor that uh, Ford has heard and, and passed on. And as a third-hand anonymous account, it has very little historiographical value. But to me, it's kind of amazing that uh, historians as well-trained as Von Brody and Dale Morgan 
cite Ford's account as if it has some value. I think uh, later historians have reached the uh, obvious conclusion that it uh, shouldn't be taken seriously. The next uh, document that leads some to people to believe the uh, eight saw the plates in vision is a letter that uh, Stephen Burnett wrote to Lyman Johnson in, on April 15, 1838. Of course, in January of 1838, uh, Joseph and Sidney Rigdon had fled Kirtland in fear of their lives. 1837 had been the year of the great uh, financial disaster, and many uh, faithful people um, became disillusioned with Joseph Smith and lost their faith. Uh, Warren Parrish, for example, had, had been quite close to Joseph Smith and, and by the mid-1837 had become a bitter foe. Uh, Stephen Burnett had been quite faithful, but he began losing his faith as he talked with Luke S. Johnson, John Boynton, both original apostles, Martin Harris and others who had been excommunicated late in 1837 after the collapse of the Kirtland Safety Society anti-banking company. Burnett wrote, When I came to hear Martin Harris state in a public congregation that he never saw the plates with his natural eyes, only in vision or imagination, neither Oliver nor David, and also that the eight witnesses never saw them meaning the plates, and hesitated to sign that instrument for that reason, but were persuaded to do it, the last pedestal gave way. In my view, our foundations was sapped and the entire superstructure fell a heap of ruins." You can really sympathize with him losing his faith. But the interesting thing is, he's getting his information from Martin Harris. The irony is that uh, Harris had become the de facto spokesman for the other witnesses. Uh, by the time Burnett wrote this letter in April of 1838, uh, the Whitmer family was all in Missouri. And some of the Smiths were still in Kirtland, but they weren't communicating with these dissenters. It had been a very tense atmosphere. And Joseph Sr. had uh, become involved in a physical altercation in the uh, Kirtland Temple with some of these dissenters. So someone like uh, Stephen Burnett, if he was trying to find out the truth of, of the eight witnesses' experience, Martin Harris was probably the best source that he had. But of the 11 witnesses, Harris is the only one known to have been alone with Joseph when he saw the plates, making him the one least qualified to speak for the others. According to Burnett, Martin Harris did not claim to have received his information from the eight witnesses themselves. It's entirely possible, especially given Martin's temperament and his bent toward what some of his colleagues called religious enthusiasm, that he made presumptions about the experience of the eight without ever consulting them. And we don't even know if Harris was on the scene at the uh, Smith Farm in Manchester when the uh, eight witnesses returned from seeing the plates. Given Martin Harris' standing as a Book of Mormon witness, Burnett, Parrish, and others naturally put a good deal of stock in his comments. We can especially sympathize with Burnett, who was still clinging to his conviction that the plates were real, when Harris's supposed declaration that the eight saw the plates only in vision brought his once strong faith crashing down into a heap of ruins. But Burnett quite understandably failed to realize that Martin's apparently ironclad pronouncement was fragile 
and that the 1829 empirical statement of the eight was still the best evidence for what they claimed to have experienced. I believe that the, the eight or any other witnesses should always be allowed to speak for themselves. And we also have a uh, controversial document created by Thomas Bullock in 1845. Early in 1839, uh, church member Theodore Turley was appointed to a committee helping the saints evacuate from Missouri. On April 4th of that year, Turley and Heber C. Kimball visited Joseph Smith and others in Liberty Jail. The next day, uh, Kimball and Turley were in Far West at the committee's office when John Whitmer and seven other men entered the room. And we, don't, we don't know exactly why John Whitmer was with these the others. And an account in the history of the church is based on uh, Bullock's notes. This is how it reads in the uh, history of the church. Also, eight men, Captain Bogart, who was the county judge, Dr. Lafferty, John Whitmer, and five, other, five others came into the committee's room and presented to Theodore Turley the paper containing the revelation of July 8, 1838, to Joseph Smith directing the Twelve to take their leave of the saints in Far West on the building site of the Lord's House on the 26th of April, which is coming right up. This uh, event is on uh, April 5th. And they were, uh, the Twelve were tasked to go to the Isles of the Sea and these uh, hostile Missourians asked Turley to read that revelation. Turley said, gentlemen, I am well acquainted with it. They said, then you as a rational man will give up Joseph Smith's being a prophet and an inspired man. He and the twelve are now scattered all over creation. Let them come here if they dare. If they do, they will be murdered. As that revelation cannot be fulfilled, you will now give up your faith. Turley jumped up and said, In the name of God, that revelation will be fulfilled. They laughed him to scorn. John Whitmer hung down his head. This is information that Bullock, while he was working on the history of the church, got from Turley. And uh, Turley then said, I now call upon you, John Whitmer. You have published to the world that an angel did present those plates to Joseph Smith. Of course, that wasn't technically what John Whitmer published to the world. He published to the world that Joseph Smith had plates. But it's often the case that the testimonies of the eight, their physical and spiritual testimonies, are conflated. Whitmer replied, I now say I handled those plates. There were fine engravings on both sides. I handled them. And he described how they were hung and, quote, they were shown to me by a supernatural power. He acknowledged all. This is an uncorroborated account, and it's also third-hand, since it's Bullock report reporting what Turdy said about what John Whitmer said. So we're not certain that, that that's what Whitmer said. Uh, nevertheless, if he did say that, the question of what he meant when he said the plates were shown to me by a supernatural power is open to debate. But a writing of this uh, purported statement of John Whitmer that I handled those plates, there were fine engravings on both sides, they were shown to me by a supernatural power, the late Grant Palmer and others have concluded that, quote, this added detail of how Whitmer saw indicates that the eight probably did not observe or feel the actual artifact. The presumption here is that the eight, is that the eight must have seen the plates in a miraculous setting. But I believe it's possible and even probable that when he said the plates had been shown to him by a supernatural power, he was reaffirming his conviction that God had, di had directed the creation and preservation of the plates as well as the translation of the Book of Mormon. It's interesting that Turley challenged Whitmer 
by referring to his testimony. And in the midst of these hostile anti-Mormons, uh, one of whom, Samuel Bogart, uh, later fled Missouri after committing a murder, in the presence of those kinds of witnesses, Whit Whitmer not only affirmed that he had handled and seen the plates, he confirmed his belief that the uh, Lord played a crucial role in the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. We can't know for certain what Whitmer meant because he had no chance to ever comment on this. But that, to me, that uncertainty itself shows that concluding the eight Concluding, quote, the eight probably did not observe or feel the actual artifact goes beyond the evidence. Uh, Bullock's third hand notes lack the historiographical authority to overrule both the testimonies of the witnesses themselves and the second hand accounts of those who talked directly to them. Uh, I discussed this in. Uh, in greater detail in an article in the summer issue of Dialogue, and that's available at uh, dialoguejournal.com. I believe uh, Terrell Givens uh, some things, sums things up pretty well. The testimony of the eight is lacking in any traces of supernaturalism. Joseph Smith simply showed them the plates, allowing them to make their own examination and draw their own conclusions. Their verdict, being freely drawn, is thus more compelling even as it is, even as it is more qualified. What emerges as alone indisputable is the fact that Joseph Smith does possess a set of metal plates. Dream visions may be in the mind of the beholder, but gold plates are not subject to such facile psychologizing. Thank you very much. Why couldn't Emma see the plates? She is, according to Emma, she didn't ask to see the plates. And she doesn't give any uh, evidence that she and Joseph discussed the matter, but she said she was can content not to see them. But she did feel the plates, and she mentions that uh, as she was cleaning house and the plates were covered with a, uh, a small cloth, she handled the plates and heard the leaves rustle. So she is a, uh, an empirical witness of the plates, but didn't request, and apparently the, the topic uh, didn't come up. Why is Grant Palmer so convinced that the eight witness, witnesses did not really see the plates in his book, An Insider's View of Mormonism? I did mention uh, Grant Palmer, and I think, you know, when I compared the uh, treatment of some, several critics' treatments of the uh, plates, I thought uh, Grant Palmer's treatment was more detailed than most. And, but I believe he was convinced by this statement of, supposed statement of John Whitmer that he's, he saw the plates through a supernatural power and what... Uh, Burnett said about Martin Harris's claim that the, the eight never saw the plates physically. I think Palmer, not that I can speak for him, but I think he found those things convincing. Was Philander Page a member of the church? And have any descendants of the Whitmers remained in the church? Where's our Whitmer? <laughs> I would be looking for Richard Anderson right now. I believe there have been descendants of the Whitmers who have joined the church, but I, I'm not positive of that. And uh, Philander Page, I'd have to double check on that, because I don't know uh, his birth date and if he joined the church in Kirtland before the Whitmers left the church. 
Is there an original eight witness holograph with original signa uh, signatures or only the page printed in the Book of Mormon? David Whitmer said that all of the witnesses signed their names to their statements, but the only, the earliest document we have is the printer's manuscript and that includes, that's in Oliver Cowdery's hand. We do not have the original manuscript for the uh, witness statements. We don't know if they signed that, but like I said, David Whitmer said they did. A blogger has argued for two set of plates, uh, one set of plates seen by the eight witnesses and the other by the three witnesses. I looked pretty carefully at all the uh, empirical accounts of the plates and, and I believe that there was one set of plates and one set only. Now I don't know why someone would argue that there were two sets of plates. Yeah, it is more work. <laughs> In some publication, you have mentioned the possibility that fake plates could be created. Yes, I have. And in fact, uh, you probably know of the Kinderhook plates. They were small, bell-shaped plates that seemed to have engraving, and uh, they were taken as authentic for a hundred years, and eventually were discovered to be a forgery of some men who got together, one of them was a blacksmith working in his shop, and they created fake plates specifically to try and deceive Joseph Smith. I think it's important if, uh, if the critics believe, uh, to me the uh, empirical evidence is undeniable that Joseph Smith had plates. So if the, if the critics believe that those uh, plates were fake, I believe it's up to them to offer an explanation. Uh, to me, it's not conceivable that Joseph Smith could have uh, produced fake plates on his own. I think the Kinderhook plates offer a good example of what it did take just to create a few small plates. To, so to create several plates with rings would have been a more difficult task, but uh, if there were fake plates, I think it would have to have been a conspiracy, not Joseph uh, working by himself. What is a good reference for your eight witness material? Uh, Richard Anderson's book about the uh, eight witnesses is good. Uh, Dan Vogel does not put all the statements in one book, but early Mormon documents is a very valuable source, and, and my recent book uh, I collected everything that I talked about in my paper. How many statements do we have for Martin Harris regarding his experience with the angel and the plates? Is there a consistent uh, pattern interpretations of these yeah. statements? Well, it's a, pre a pretty uh, it's a curious case about Martin Harris because several believers who talked to Martin reported that he said, I saw the plates with my physical eyes. Several non-believers reported that Martin said, I saw them with my spiritual eyes. So that's a difficult thing to try and understand. Maybe he was speaking to each audience in terms he thought they would understand or, you know. But it is fairly consistent. We have several examples of both. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Oh, that's right. Give certificate.